Hi, y'all. This is Kristen Chenoweth. Hi, I'm Gloria Stefan. This is Sarah Bareilles. Hi, I'm Patty Lapone. This is Lynn Manuel Miranda. You're listening to the Broadway Podcast Network. Welcome to the Theater Podcast, intimate personal conversations with theater's biggest names. This episode is with Nick Searley and Lauren Molina, otherwise known as the duo that is the Skivvies. They are another example of making careers around Broadway without actually being on a Broadway stage. And as their name implies, they do take off their clothes, they are performing in their underwear, but they do it to be comfortable, not to be sexy. And there is a there's a big difference that we did talk about in the episode. So it's not about taking off clothes for the sake of like sexual activity. It's just being comfortable, being different, calling attention to this wonderful, wonderful music. And they've been doing it for a long time to actually promote uh, body positivity. They've got tons of body types. It's basically they tell their guests they have these major Broadway stars coming up and performing with them. So they tell their guests wear whatever you want. So some people wear onesies, some people wear lingerie, some people wear robes. It's literally all types of people all types of bodies. It's one of the most inclusive efforts that I have seen in a very long time. So, you know, good good on you guys. Please visit me online at ttp.fm and show your support for the podcast via ttp.fm slash Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. The proceeds from those so far have been going to getting all the episodes transcribed. So thank you. There's been a couple fans who have written in and asked to transcribe as well. So I've been using those and I really appreciate it, but we're working on accessibility. We're working on getting this word out to everybody. So on that note, please turn to the person next to you, say, hey, you should subscribe to this podcast I'm listening to. Everyone now, please enjoy this episode with The Skivvies. Here you go. One, two, three. Today I have the pleasure of speaking with two singer, musician, actors who are known both for their Broadway resumes and also for performing stripped down arrangements of popular songs and original tunes while literally stripping down to their underwear. Hashtag plagiarized from Wikipedia. As Out Magazine may be said best, they're part Weird Al parody and part sexy burlesque. They are none other than Nick Searley and Lauren Molina, also known as The Skivvies. Welcome to the theater podcast. Hi. Hi. The Skivvies, also known as like your undies. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's the play on words. Get it? Mm -hmm. For those who don't know, the two of you are a very popular New York-based duo band that perform exclusively in your skivvies. Yeah, or some form of undress that's just not typical normal clothes. We just, it's kind of like a costume or a pajama party. So, okay, I, I'm going to get back to, like, the two of you, your beginnings, your childhood and whatnot. But I still want to know, I'm going to talk about the Skivvies first and and tell me about, like, when did you meet and where did this idea come from? Sure. Well, we met in 2003 doing a children's theater tour together. And it was uh, a theater works, uh, you know, tour. The show was called The Just So Stories. And um, we drove a van across the country, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, performing in the grandest cafetoriums of the land. Theater Works is great for your equity card. It yeah, sure is. Yeah, that's how you get it. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, we got it. <laughs> yeah, we were just right out of college, so it was, you know, the first job right. we both had together. And, you know, they say in trying times you bond. And so Nick and I quickly became best friends, and we uh, returned after that tour back to the city and started making music together with our clothes on. And, uh, you know, we would perform at places like the Duplex or the Lori Beachman, and it would be as, like, solo artist with special guest, Mm -hmm. you know, with the Mm -hmm. other person. One of us with the other, yeah. And, um, you know, we were making uh, arrangements that were medleys and mashups similar to what we were doing these days, but um, it didn't really, nothing really happened with, with that. And then it wasn't until 2012, we were hanging out at my house, and I said, Let's put a cover song up on YouTube. That's what all the kids are doing these days, and um, and we do it just as well. <laughs> so uh, we decided to strip down Rihanna's "We Found Love," and we set up the video camera, and uh, we made the arrangement. And I was trying to figure out what to wear for the video, and I was walking around my bedroom in my bra, and Nick said, "Why don't you just wear that?" And I was like, "Oh, well, we are stripping down the arrangement. What if we did a whole..." stripped down series for YouTube, but never 
comment on it. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> and then, makes sense. and then my boyfriend from the kitchen yelled, um, "You should call yourselves the Skivvies." And we were like, "Yes, what else? Tell us what else? What else? No, that's a great idea. That's a great idea." And so we did these videos. They started. And your to boyfriend go, from the living room said, "That's a great idea." And yeah. Your from the bathroom said, "I concur." Yeah, <laughs> just like your boyfriend in each room. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, actually, I was telling him uh, that, like, you know, we've told this story many times, and and uh, he's like. Every time I say like, oh yeah, and then from the kitchen he yelled. He's like, I just like imagine my like people, the audiences like reading that or hearing that, saying like, like imagining him like just sweating over a, a stove, <laughs> just like stirring a stew. You, you like, <laughs> yeah. you know, in this fury. yeah, exactly. <laughs> As he's like churning butter. Um, anyway, so um, so yeah, we we made these videos. They started to go viral, and um, we did our first live show um, about. About five months later, and um, you know, fans on the internet were commenting on the videos, saying, "You know, you guys should do a live show," and uh, also saying, "You guys are so talented; you don't need to take your clothes off." And to that, I reply, "If we hadn't, you wouldn't have clicked." Yes, <laughs> exactly. So we're aware of the fact that it's such a gimmick to take off your clothes and have people notice you. It's the oldest trick in the book, in fact, and it just so happened to get us noticed in a way that was surprisingly quick. And um, people were like, wow, actually, these guys are talented. And um, and what a fun gimmick. And what a, what a fun photo op. And what a fun, like, concept to have all of these, you know, Broadway performing performers coming together um, in a sort of variety show and show off this, like, loosey-goosey side of themselves that often when you're a actor in New York City, you don't get to be so, um, be so bold and playful. Um, you know, you often will get asked to sing a song in a cabaret or, you know what I mean? But you don't get to explore, um, making mashups and medleys and, and costuming thematically. And, you know, we really have fun with our, our guests. And um, it provides a platform for all of us to really just be creative together. And I think that's what people really latch on to, the audiences latch on to, and why it's been such a success is that it's just all about sense of humor and levity and joy and happiness through music. You kind of hit both sexual preference demographics too, because you've got, you've got gay men and straight men and I guess gay women and straight women, yeah, yeah, you gotta hit everything. Honestly, yeah. we, yeah, we check a lot of boxes. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. It's true. So you've got a huge following, <laughs> and, and I mean, you were just saying before we started recording that you just came from tour. Like mm -hmm. yesterday, you came back from San Francisco, right? Yeah, yeah we have two days off, mm -hmm. <laughs> and then we go back out on the road uh, to Southern California, and we head up uh, Palm Springs and Laguna and San Diego. It's a, it's. A joy. Honestly, December is our busiest month because we have a holiday show that we take all around the country. And it is just, you know, you can just kind of, I cringe at like holiday music. So we just turn it all on its head and make it very fun and ridiculous and irreverent and very palatable. Well, how do you, how do you approach the arrangements? Because... Well, we well, there's a couple. I mean, I could use a couple of examples. Uh, for example, one of my favorite ones that we do is uh, Winter Wonderland with John Mayer's Your Body is a Wonderland, mm -hmm. and we put it together and call it Your Body is a Walking in a Winter Wonderland. <laughs> and then I, another one that we do it like that's just a, a fun one I like to put together in the audience room. We respond like, "Oh, clever!" But then the other one I really enjoy in our show that's just us, not necessarily a guest, is when Lauren reveals a secret to the audience, and we do a, a twist on Santa Baby, and she does. I saw mommy kissing Santa Claus into Santa's baby where she confesses that she's actually the daughter of Santa, that mm -hmm. Santa's her dad. And I think it's a really, it's the audience normally eats it up because they're hearing a song that they hear every day in a very different way. And I hope, I always hope like after that song is done, I'm like, when they hear that song on the radio later tonight when they're driving home, they might think of the new twist on it. Yeah. I, I really like making a, yeah. a, a stamp on their brains yeah. that way. Yeah. We also have like, um, we, we love to play quirky instruments, you know, besides the cello and the ukulele. Um, but we play these handbells, and while we're playing them, uh, we have a mashup that's, that starts with, um, you can ring my bell, goes into, you know, um, sleigh bell or jingle bells, and uh, 
Wow, I'm like drawing a blank on all the bells. Um, Hark, how the bells, sweet silver Car- bells. Carol the bells. Carol the bells, thank yeah. you. Um, I love Carol. Carol. She's a good, she's, yeah. <laughs> she's great. Carol, Carol welcome of, to the stage. Of the, of bells. the bells. De la bells. <laughs> Robin of <Yeah>. Loxley. <laughs> Robin of Loxley and Carol of the bells. <laughs> exactly. It's like all songs of bells, um, silver bells, um, ring my bell. Oh, I said that first. And Jingle then, bells. Jingle bells, ding-a-ling, my ding-a-ling, your oh, ding-a-ling, ding-a-ling, if I were a bell. Oh, uh, yeah. All you, of get you get it. You get it. <laughs> that's so basically that's what we do. And like we we play boom whackers and it's little drummer boy mashed up with we got the beat, you know. And and you've also got uh, on the website at least listed the Glockenspiel and the melodica. Sure, they mm-hmm. make an appearance and, uh-huh. on the Glockenspiel for the holiday show. We have two, and we do a sleigh medley, which we entitle "Slay My Name," and it's all <laughs> songs where we take we substitute "slay" in for like "say." Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, it really works out. Um. One of my favorite things to do that is not anywhere close to this is sing songs with girl in it, like, hey, girl, but change it to squirrel. My kids eat that up. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, Classic. I'm into that. <laughs> I'm like, hey, squirrel. <laughs> okay. So take me back. Nick, we'll start with you. Take me back to baby Nick. Yep. Where, where did you grow up? I grew up in a town called Fairfield, Ohio, which is between Dayton and Cincinnati. Uh, we were just in Cincinnati Friday. Um, and I went to school in Boston, got my BFA there, met Lauren pretty much a couple months after that and moved to New York. I mean, I moved to New York, then met Lauren, but yeah. And, and did you grow up um, with a love of theater? Or yes. Like, so when did I was you, putting dance classes when I was three. Oh, really? Uh, my family has a has a slew of dance studios in Ohio. There were three. And uh, so I was put into those classes at three. And then around the third grade or so, I was I did my first play and I I was like, okay, this is what I'm doing. <laughs> so and you, you also were, did show choir. Oh yeah, I did all the things. Where did the instruments come in? Well, my dad. I was taught by a nun every every Tuesday uh, p- a piano, how to play piano. Uh, and my dad is also a pianist, so music's always been very prevalent in the house. Mm-hmm. Um, and and so I. I guess I've always had an ear for it, but um, yeah, I guess I was taught from a- the ages of eight to 18, uh, a nun came over and taught me piano every Tuesday. And that was where I, that's kind of what I, all I did. I didn't really pick up the ukulele until literally the day with the skivvies. Um, yeah, a little bit before I felt like. Sure, but- a grace period of a month or two, <laughs> but it was for, for that. Uh, it was right 2012 for sure. Um, and I, 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 she had one, a ukulele and I was like, can I borrow that? Mm-hmm. Teach me four chords. And then yeah. you can play pretty much anything with four chords. Now we've made a living playing four chords. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of popular artists have. That's right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right, Lauren, so where did you grow up? I grew up in Detroit, Michigan. And my father is a bass player. My mom's a dancer. Also had music in the house always. Um, I picked up piano, started taking lessons at four or five. And then um, I picked up the cello in fifth grade. And uh, so I was doing both of those instruments. And then on my own uh, in high school, I thought I would be cool and teach myself how to play acoustic guitar. Um, Mm -hmm. And then uh, I was in college when I um, was like first asked to play the cello in a show. And that was new for me. Um, I had played, you know, I had sung in bands and I had... uh, you know, growing up, I I always loved to sing, and I was always like in the musicals at school. Um, but I never actually thought that I would go into musical theater or acting as a career. I thought I thought it was just a fun hobby, and it just came easily mm-hmm. and naturally to me. But I was very academic, and so I, you know, was always just like, I'm going to be a doctor or a veterinarian. And then I took AP chemistry and I was like, I will not be a doctor, <laughs> <laughs> nor a veterinarian. And then, um, yeah, I uh, I went to, my safety school was the University of Michigan. I didn't get into my top choices of schools. And while I was there, I was like, oh, actually I hear that the musical theater program is, is really good here. Yeah, everybody <laughs> like, comes out of UM. <laughs> And I was very fortunate. I I applied as a as a transfer student, and I got in. Um, I mean, there's a lot more to it, but I uh, I was very lucky. And um, and so while I was there, I I was actually in a production where I was asked to play cello uh, and improvise in this 
weird production of Hamlet where I was like dressed as Ophelia, but I, I didn't play the role of Ophelia, but I was one of the players. And every time Ophelia was on stage, I would sit on stage in a different area and like play the cello as her voice and like improvise in this like weird postmodern thing. It was really hip. And then, <laughs> um, and That's so Brooklyn. It is. It's so <laughs> Brooklyn. And then, um, so that was like kind of my first on stage in costume playing the cello. And then, so I, when I was cast uh, in Sweeney Todd, it was wild. I mean, after five auditions and the final one for Stephen Sondheim sitting five feet away, uh, just like for his approval, it was like, you know, a dream come true, surreal, all of it. And um, I remember being like, okay, so where are the music stands going to be on stage for the show? And they're like, oh no, you're going to memorize the entire score. <laughs> and I was like... <laughs> Cool. All right. <laughs> and so anyway, th th all that to say is, is um, you know, I developed this new skill set of singing and playing the cello at the same time. Had that not happened, the skivvies certainly would not have been born, I don't think. Um, and, uh, and yeah, then Nick and I uh, just kind of like it, – it's, it's wild. From, from that point on, um, you know, I did Sweeney Todd and then um, – Rock of Ages, and then sweet, and then Skiffy's. That's like kind yeah, it was of right the, after Rock of Ages. Yeah, so those are two. The Broadway, so Sweeney Todd on Broadway in two thousand five. Then do the then tour in 07. Uh huh. Yeah, and then Rock of Ages two thousand nine. And Nick, you were in the All Shook Up mm -hmm. first national tour in 06. Mm -hmm. So that yeah, that that's been it's been a year or two. Since 05, 06, 07. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've done tons of theater since yeah. then. Those are just like the hits on the resume <laughs> that people like to. The parenthetical street cred. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like after, after Rock of, I left Rock of Ages to do Cunagunda and Candide mm -hmm. um, at the Shakespeare Theater, Huntington Theater, Goodman Theater. And then, yeah, actually it was after that, that, that the, uh, the Skivvies were born. Because we were like, hmm, what do we do now? Let's hang out and make some music. Well, how many auditions, uh, auditions, how many instruments do you both play collectively? I've never counted, point? but I always say, you know, I will try any instrument. And so if you consider that playing it or not, I mean, for when we did Charlie Brown um, at the actor and musician Charlie Brown that was at Playhouse in the Park earlier mm -hmm. this year, I mean, there were 85 instruments that were played in that show. Now that also included, we say eight, 85 instruments, but that included like a rain stick, you know, it could, yes. many things qualify. So how many instruments? I have no idea, but I would say I don't play anything that would be cello oriented or string like that. Um, you don't uh, play anything with a bow. I would not bo be bowing. How, uh, Lauren, I guess you were saying you started out in piano, but now for Skivvies, you're, you're primarily cello, or do you just still get in, in playing a lot of piano there too? No, I mean, I, I've, I would say, okay, if we're going to count things out, I can play um, cello, guitar, ukulele, bass, mandolin, some piano, and which means that I can play some melodica because it's a, Keyboarded, mm -hmm. keyboard instrument. Yeah, anything piano based is like like okay, a glockenspiel. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, uh, let's see. Um, you drum? Oh yes, I've played. I've played a drum kit or a hand drum. Um, I've played a a recorder and a penny whistle, but not well. <laughs> and I've played on stage in a show in a John Doyle production called Ten Cents a Dance. I played the saxophone, but. And I've done it on stage, but please don't make me do it again. <laughs> um, but yes, I can play the saxophone. Um, and uh, yeah, I feel like, I again, I'm willing to try anything eight times. But <laughs> I, I, don't, um, I don't like to do woodwinds so much. That's yeah. my... I, I I don't play really any instruments, and I feel like it's if you learn one reed instrument, it kind of translates a horn instrument. Yeah, it translates. Yeah, so you're saying the keyboard translates to tra many other things. To many other yeah. things. Yeah, but reading music is reading music. Do you you're you often perform with guests? Um, I guess to start out, did you did you originally know that you were going to have guests, or was it just the two of you to start, or how long how long before us. you had a guest? Well, uh, the first video was just me and and Lauren. Right. And then the second video, we had a guest. Or no, second video was me and Lauren. I mean, yeah, because it was Rihanna's We Found Love, then it was the Lana Del Rey, wasn't it? Oh, I thought it was Carol King. Oh, it was Carol King. Yes, you're right. And then it was Wes. 
Okay. Yeah. So I think that was number three. So that, but that was just a thing. We were like, come over, take off your clothes and let's do a, let's do a, this idea. <laughs> Wesley that, Taylor. Um, who's a Broadway star. Absolutely. Yeah. He, and then I would say after that, we did another one that was just us. No more videos before then had a guest. And then we invited our friends when Joe's Pub was like, or we, we were like, let's do this show at Joe's Pub. Um, that's when we were like, let's ask like six people if they would be interested to do it. And that's kind of when it happened. We haven't, it's interesting because we kind of set it up for ourselves to do it that way, but that was never the, that was never the angle until it was like, oh, that went well. It just revealed itself. It did. It really just. Revealed. I see what you did. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I would love, I've, <laughs> I've said this for years, like I, I would love the opportunity and we've done this you know, sometimes out of town, but not very much at all. I love when it's just the two of us and we get to do our favorites, our hits, the things that we want to do, because I do love the guest aspect, but oftentimes that becomes completely centered around the guest's arrangement, which is amazing. We love to we love to work and collaborate with someone. Mm -hmm. But when it's just the two of us, it's like we finally can work on something that like a new something for us uh, that we yeah, we're had often, an idea. Yeah, we're often so so used to like packing our shows, especially in New York City, with as many guest stars as possible. And, and it actually started out with, in a kind of annoying way, where venues would be like, okay, so the Skivvies, um, we want to book you, but who can you bring as who your special you guest? Yeah. And we were like, what, the Skivvies aren't enough? And, then, and it just kind of like rubbed us the wrong way. And, uh, and yet, here we are, we're, we're doing it, and now people don't ask us that. But um, so touring now, you you don't have guests. We do. You do. We do. We bring people. We usually it it's it depends. But sometimes we bring one person and then use locals. We or sometimes we only use locals. 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 <laughs> yeah. I can't speak. Yeah, it's it's you know venues will ask us for sometimes specific people or they're like bring somebody who you want to bring and then therefore that's why we've performed with Matt Doyle and Nick Adams a lot on the road because we've created so much in their canon it's like we could mm -hmm. do an entire set with both of them at this point with, without and we wouldn't have to sing a lick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, and also like Leslie Margarita we've performed on the road with or uh, Leslie McDonald. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but we have. There are certain guests that are we call them Broadway or Skivvy's royalty, and they have a handful of more than a handful of songs. Morgan James, mm -hmm. uh, even like Lena Hall. Laura uh, could do probably Laura Benanti seven or eight with us now. Mm -hmm. And Randy Randy Harrison. Randy yep. Harrison, yeah. he's also come with us out of town. Oh yeah, and you've had Drew Lachey, Keila Settle. Yeah. Oh yeah, even mm -hmm. Lynn. The Lynn great, Manuel, the great Lynn. Yeah, the great Lynn. Yeah, I know. We we snagged him before he got. Too um, unavailable. <laughs> <laughs> Is it hard to to pitch to the guests? Are Not anymore. Like, no, we, I don't at think. We like Wesley. You're like, hey, come over. Oh no, Wesley loves off. to take his clothes off. Yeah, <laughs> not, not an issue. I, at I would all. say in the beginning when it was we were getting our name out there and what we were what we. We're doing our like, mission statement, our like brand. our brand, mm -hmm. yeah. But now, not to like, now this is in no way coming. I don't want it to be cocky or anything, but like we are able to. Most people we we approach are like, we know what the skivvies do, so right. that's been a lot more helpful. But that just comes in getting old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're seven years old now. Yeah, um, and I will say that like. You know, certain people, like I remember, I, mean, I can say it, like we approached Cheyenne Jackson many, many years ago, like in the first year. And we were like, oh, he'd be a perfect guest for us. And he was like, I'm not taking my clothes off anymore. Really? Psych. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's what he told us. He yeah. still did it on television when he was paid a lot for it. Yes. But, <laughs> but like certain certain guests were like, well, that's just not my, that's not my speed. Well, I also, I am to that, I mean, if somebody were to say that to me today, um, I would, so many people don't take their clothes off. It's a, it's Skivvies is a state of mind, I always say. So you can perform in a onesie as long as like, we just don't want it to be ordinary. Uh, we just- it, it, People sleep in lots of things. People, yeah. yeah. I mean, Alice, who performs with us a gazillion times, she wear, always wears a dress. Sometimes it's see-through. Sometimes she doesn't wear a bra. <laughs> that's fun. But like, it doesn't matter. She can, anybody can wear whatever they want as long as they're playing the game and they always are if they showed up. So <laughs> I'd really, yeah. we really It's don't really care. not about what you wear. And you, we want people to feel comfortable. And oftentimes audiences even say that they forget we're in our underwear after the first five minutes. It's because a costume. It's, yeah. it's a costume. It's all about the music. It's all about the fun and the frivolity of it all. So it often feels like to me also when you're on a beach, it's like you don't really, right. 
remember, you don't, you're not like looking at everyone being like, look at all these bathing suits. You don't really like, say that. So that's what it feels like to me, like bathing suits, really. Was it hard for the two of you the first time you went out on stage in your underwear? I was very nervous. Yes. Were you? Yes. Well, I, I was more just thinking, how are people going to like feel about it? Yeah. It was, I didn't feel like they were going to judge me and my body. I didn't feel, and also Nick and I, have <laughs> we've been cast in so many shows we were before that where we had to be in various states of undress um like even in in rock of ages i danced around as a stripper mm-hmm. i mean i wore a pink thong and a push up bra and like high patent leather boots and you know i feel like that was way more um you know, sexy and risque and burlesque than me standing in a bra and underwear playing the cello or <laughs> the ukulele. You know, sure. um, there's this, this like sense of humor with it that doesn't take itself seriously. And I think that's why, you know, when people are like, oh my God, you're so brave to perform in your underwear. First of all, I mean, I guess I am, but there's just a part of me that thinks like, oh, it's just a costume. And when you're already so vulnerable by exposing yourself like that, people are on your side. So if something messes up musically, they're like, yeah, who cares? You're in your underwear, you know? <laughs> and um, and on top of that, like, I, I just feel like I am in control of what I wear. There's no rules with the skivvies to, mm-hmm. to the costuming. Um, I mean, sometimes I wear a bodysuit that's like, it's almost like a, a one-piece bathing suit, you know? And... Um, and I feel great in it. I feel just as sexy. And uh, there's, I get to decide what I want to wear. Nobody else does. And that's empowering too. Mm-hmm. Is it about being, about being sexy or about being comfortable? I think com- comfortable for me. I mean, if I'm, I, want, I need to feel comfortable. And that goes back to what I was going to say about our first concert. I remember when we were taking off our clothes for the first time, I felt very nervous about it because I'm fine being without a shirt on or whatever, but I didn't know how that was going to come across to an audience of paying one, you know, 150 people pay, paying to see, see me take off my clothes. And like, what does that make them, what kind of person do they think I am? Like, right. I'm so hot standing up here. Cause that's not the way I come. I don't, I don't want to give that. Cause I don't think that. Right. right. Um, so I remember that the first concert, even I wore sunglasses because I was so, I wore oh. sunglasses in almost all the videos. And in the very first uh, concert, I was like, I just, don't want any, I can't look anyone in the eye. <laughs> I have to get used to this. Yeah. And now I don't wear sunglasses, but. Yeah, it's not, it's definitely about being comfortable. And I mean, I don't, I don't want to say it's not about like looking sexy or feeling sexy because like, that's just, I feel like that comes across with just confidence and um, it's a sort of like, a, like we said, like a state of mind. Um, but, uh, but yeah, sexy, it's not, it's not sexual, but mm-hmm. I think, you know, it's, it's body positive. We are, we are body positive and, um, we are just like, however, however you want to present yourself to feel good, that is sexy. Yeah. That's what I was, I was looking through the range of guests and it's just all different types of body types mm-hmm. of different genders, different types, different mm-hmm. builds. Mm-hmm. And it, and it's got to be empowering too to to some of the guests too to to be able to present themselves in a way uh, that maybe their that society doesn't normally right. get to see them in. In fact, Bonnie Milligan um, performed with us uh, last year or no earlier this year, and um, yeah, over the August. summer. Yeah, it was our yeah. August show. And um, and uh, right right after that, we had a hater. No, before that. Oh, it was. Bo- yeah, because oh. she talked about it on stage. Oh, okay, that's right. I'm sorry. Getting we had a person on Twitter up. come after us and say that we only, um, we basically only use hot white gay men as period. our guests. Like that was the blanket statement. And that we're not inclusive. And I was like, that couldn't be farther from the truth. Like, first of all, you're you're like cherry picking your facts. You're cherry picking your videos to post, and they like like took screenshots of examples of some, you know, fit, fit white gay dudes. And, um, and yes, we have had plenty of those, but plenty of other styles of people too. And, um, and so she was like the first to jump to our defense being a basically gorgeous plus size model, fierce, um, confident woman who, 
just like owns her body mm-hmm. and owns her everything. And uh, I think she's sexy as hell. And she was just like, by the way, you're wrong. And it was just so, it was great to have her come to our defense and then like basically just like list off all of these other types of um, performers and you know, people that have- So then that, the, for that show, we were like, what are we going to sing with Bonnie? What are we going to sing with Bonnie? We were like, you know what? We'll take exactly what just happened on Twitter and make it into a into a mashup. <laughs> so we took body positivity, being beautiful, all the things into her mashup and she told the story. And it, was it was all about being beautiful and uh, yeah, well, I'm trying to remember all of the songs. We do so many mashups that I can't keep them straight. <laughs> um, yeah. It was beautiful. The word was beautiful. So it was like beautiful from Head Over Heels, which is what she sang. My Reflection from Mulan. And then it was beautiful by Christina Aguilera. Do you, how long does it take you to do the arrangements? Like if if something happens today on Twitter and tomorrow I'm in your mm-hmm. show with you, can, yeah. we, can we get something together in a day? Yeah. Oh, we work fast. Absolutely. Oh, yeah? In fact, in fact, Nick gets annoyed with me because as we're like driving into each town on, on our tour, I was like, hey, maybe we can think of like a, just like a, a little mashup to – you know, start the show with of all songs of like Colorado, like as we're like driving in, into our venue in in Denver, like Rocky Mountain High, Colorado, <laughs> and like you know that we made actually like a high medley for Colorado. We've made a California medley. We've made a Florida medley. We've made a um, gosh, but like you know, we just literally do the hour before. Oh, that's crazy! It normally happens yeah. during sound check. Really? Yeah, sound check. Yeah. yeah. You and you guys and Ben Folds would get along very well. Uh, I'm sure. I bet we would. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're listening, Ben Folds, <laughs> you can join us anytime. <laughs> um, all right. Let's see. You've made appearances on, gosh, in, in pilots for Fox, A&E, WE, as well as performing at fundraising events. Like, you're asked to perform at Broadway Bears, uh, Broadway Cares, Equity Fights AIDS. Um like you're a sought after sort of staple of New York now. I think the New York theater scene, like a theater adjacent sort of thing, and it's it's incredible to me to kind of like watch things, watch the direction you're going in because you've made complete careers out of Broadway without having to be on Broadway all the time. Yeah, exactly. Well, I, th- I think it's because it's a sensibility and it's theatrical what we do. Mm-hmm. It's not just st- standing up there and singing a pop song. It's not just... Uh, you know, telling a story of how I moved to New York City and another, <laughs> another hundred people, people just got, got off of the bus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, that's um, right. But, you know, we create our arrangements to have a sort of storytelling element and to try to expose lyrics in a way that shows their um, irreverence and absurdity. And so, like I said, going back to like the sense of humor, but also... Um, you know, the journey uh, that each song takes, um, you know, some some are more storytelling than others, but, um, you know, to involve the Broadway community. I think it's like not, not only the theatricality, but the fact that we have embraced Broadway as much as they've embraced us. And, um, and it's a way for audiences to see their favorite Broadway performers in a new way. That's more them than playing a character. Well, yeah, they get to goof off, and, yeah. and in the in the age now of I think of social media and the behind the scenes sort of stuff, it, there you're not only seeing these characters, these these people that you hear on soundtracks and you see on on stages um, in their own sort of natural element, but you're literally seeing them with less clothes on. I think it makes their vulnerability makes more of a connection mm-hmm. to, the, to the audience, yeah. which is probably you know what, what you're saying. Like you guys didn't get noticed until you started taking your clothes off. Not in a sexual way, but yeah, it's it's a vulnerability sort of thing. Mm-hmm. I will also say too. I keep saying like it's about the sense of humor, but our arrangements, and I will be proud of this. Like they're clever, they're they're smart. It's not just silly, goofy fun. Well, I, we 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 are well thought. We we think about them very intensely. So I, it, they're clever and smart, but it's also because we put a lot of time thinking about them. Like to the point ad nauseum at, at some of them. We're like, well, why would we tell that story? What you know. Do you guys ever, like, have you ever fought, like, you're like, I have to do this mashup, and you're, uh, and there's no way, or do, you're always like, oh, okay, cool. No. No. <laughs> I mean, we have disagreements maybe on, like, which song should be first or which section to use, but, like, there's, no. But usually with us, it's like, we'll. Tr- Who cares? I'll, yeah, and also, <laughs> like, we both are of the same minds. It's like, well, let's try it and just see what feels right, because I don't like to make an opinion about something, like, something like that until we've 
tried it because I don't think an opinion like would yeah. work. <laughs> it's the, the whole that's also what I am very proud of with the skivvies is how collaborative it is uh-huh. um, with not only each other, Nick and Lauren, but with all of our special guests that come in. Sometimes we'll get an idea and we'll create the arrangement and then we'll meet up with the special guest and then they will give us input and we'll tweak it together, the three of us, um, or if it's two people, the four of us, you know, um, but it's never like, this is the, this is the cut and dry version and that's the way it is. Like nothing is, is precious and, uh, we are all about, you know, changing things up in the moment and. Or at Soundcheck, as we told yeah. you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, w- what is the what does it mean to be in residence somewhere? You've had several residencies, so it's just a regular mainstay that they that they keep having us back. So uh, fifty four below, I think, was the first one that gave us a residency where we it wasn't. I think it was like we had two a month or something like yeah, that for a six month period kind of deal. Um, so that was the residency there. Joe's has us like once a month, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. so that would be a residency. We have 42 West, Highline Ballroom. Yeah, you mentioned we Joe's did a Pub. brunch. We did a brunch residency. Oh, that was like, it went on a while. For um, about a year. The Green Room 42. That was our first. I was like, it would be fun to do brunches. And in retrospect, <laughs> it could be fun to do brunches. <laughs> but I think we're more of a, of a late night thing. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. You need to get at the tail end of brunch when everyone's had the yeah the they, open-ended sangria, mm-hmm. the bottomless sangria, a little bit. It, too and much. that was a great experience. I'm glad we did that. I, I, I have no ill feelings about those brunches, but it was a, a, a learning experience. I thought about mm-hmm. you know timing, uh, timing, mm-hmm. timing on a Sunday. What time? Uh, because people will go to brunch and then typically go to a matinee. So or. Right, and that's why, like, yeah, the timing of that was like we had to do a brunch before the matinees, and then so it just felt kind of like early for brunch, and then um, the people that were coming to our shows, uh, it was at the the Green Room Forty Two, and it was just starting out, kind of, and um, and it felt like even more than our fans coming to the show were people like the guests of the hotel. So they were like, what's going on? And they were like a bit quieter and more reserved than usual. So, you know, it's just like figuring out who is your audience and like what... um, Some jokes land better at night. Yeah, (laughs) it's true. (laughs) But I will say, speaking of audiences, like a lot of people think, oh, you know, the skivvies, they're, they're like titillating and burlesque and like the audiences are probably just like young folks that come to those shows, but actually it's ticket, it's ticket buyers who see theater. It's people, it's mostly actually older people, I would say, you know, young, young people too. But, um, you know, when we're out on the road, especially in like presumably conservative towns, you would think that, um, they would be like more reserved, but they are ready for it. They're like hungry for the this niche that we've created of comedy and music. And um, you know, it's it's like, you know, it's it goes back to this the smart arrangements and um, you know, a, a bit of culture, you know, even though we're in our underwear. <laughs> uh, well, speaking of which, that leads me to a good question that I got from a, a Patreon patron of mine. Have you ever had any wardrobe malfunctions? Oh, mm-hmm. sure. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't know about it until I saw it on Playbill the next oh, no! day. Uh, it was uh, in the photo gallery, and I was scrolling through back when I would actually look through all of them because it was very early on. And I, it was a moment where I forget the song. It was Safe and Sound. I used to play Safe and Sound while she did a solo, the song Safe and Sound. Um, while you did your solo, I would play my part on my back, just like laying on the floor. Um all the way, literally laying on the ground, and a picture was taken, and my ball was out. <laughs> and I didn't know about it. Nobody saw it, and no, I guess nobody told me about it that day. I'm sure somebody saw it, but and, nobody well, told and the you. The picture was taken and put on Playbill, and I had to write Playbill, who is awesome. They always, you know, do great coverage of our stuff. And I was like, "Can we please take this picture down?" <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, that's a wardrobe malfunction, sure. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I've had a I've had a, a nip slip. Here or there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I th- I think it's bound to happen after how many shows? Yeah. Absolutely. Oh god, I don't even know. If we had to count, I feel like we did a hundred this yesterday. <laughs> so another another patron question is what is your gym routine? And are you are you more hyper aware of your bodies given how you are now, or you're like you can go home and you have your pizza and your chocolate 
or or are you like, oh, I can't. I you know, I perform in my underwear. Um, well, I don't have a consistent workout, and I do regret not working out consistently, but. Because when I do, I feel great. I just am unmotivated. And you would think that the skivvies would be my motivation. <laughs> but I um, I try to eat healthy. And uh, I try to, um, you know, avoid foods that make me feel yucky and <laughs> bloated. But um, but that's, especially right now, we're in the holiday season. So that's, it's. It's inevitable. Um, so when I do feel like I I need to tighten up, I'll just do some sit ups. I'll do some yoga. I'll you know uh, do a quick workout. But um, mostly, I just walk around the city with my cello on my back, and that's my workout. <laughs> <laughs> How heavy is a cello? Um, my acoustic cello is in the case. Um, I would say it's about like twenty five pounds. Okay, small child. Yeah, mm-hmm. small child weight on your back. On your, on your back yeah. all day. Yeah. Um, but my electric cello is much lighter. I'd say it's about 10 pounds. Oh, yeah, because it has no body, right? It's just yeah. The, yeah. Okay. I mean, so, I do go to the gym. I've gone to the gym since I was in high school. It's always just been a way of my life. I have to go in the morning. My brain works better. I don't really make great decisions before I go to the gym. So I do most of my, any correspondences that have to be dealt with, like that requires brain power, I usually do at the gym or after. Hmm. Um, but it's more about that for me. I do, I do go to the gym a lot, but I like it. <laughs> so you you were already in shape before the skivvies. You didn't get in shape for the skivvies. No, I did not get in yeah. shape for the skivvies. And also, like when I'm in a show, that is like I call it like show shape, and because you're running your show around body. your show yeah. body, like yeah. you're you're running around, you're singing, and like you know the the energy that it takes to you know do all of that, and the cardio when you're dancing and singing. I mean, that's it. Just the weight will fall off um, usually, or um, like I was, I did this show called Desperate Measures um, last year, and um, I decided to like actually really focus on diet, and I called it being on my crudité life, where I basically just ate rabbit food, <laughs> like <laughs> my crudité of carrots and celery and any like raw vegetables. Like I pretty much ate that um, exclusively with protein, and the weight just really. It's not weight. I don't, I don't care about my weight. For me, it's just like just tightening up jiggle. Yeah. There it is. Yeah. All right. So we're going to go to the standard closing questions here that I use. Oh. I ask everyone the same three questions to end every podcast. So okay. Lauren, we'll start with you. The first one is just what motivates you? Uh, what motivates me? Um, that's a really great question. Uh, I think... Um, motivates me. Uh, wow, I'm really taking a long time with this because I feel like it can go lots of directions. This is like going to a restaurant with Lauren. I know. <laughs> it takes me a long time to figure out what I'm ordering. Okay, no, what motivates me is like knowing that the ultimate goal will be um, positive. Like if I, if knowing that what I, if I, if I act a certain way, something will be better off. Okay. Okay. Right? Okay. You know what I mean? Yes, I do. So like, um, so I foster kittens and I like know if I, and sometimes it's a lot of freaking hard work and it's a lot of money and time and energy, but like, I know that I'm saving these little kittens life and I know that it is making a difference in the world. Um, you know, what motivates me, uh, is, I, is to work extra hard and to like spend, um, extra time and energy to work on an audition. Because if I don't do that, I will regret not putting in the time and energy. So I know just like what motivates me like is, is like putting in the time and energy, um, to know that in the end, the result will be better. Okay. Nick? Fear and desperation. Just kidding. <laughs> um, money. <laughs> yeah. No, I would say, um, I am motivated by the idea of creating something out of nothing. I love the idea. So I am very motivated to see something blank and put something there. And even if it's a shit show, I am happy that I did it. So I'm always motivated by just just simple creativity 
activities. <laughs> <laughs> right. So Nick, we'll start here with the second one. Okay. Um, what advice would you give to your younger self and younger people listening now, starting out down a similar path? Yes, I would. I would say if anyone tells you, I remember when I was this is specific for like when I was looking at colleges, um, I felt that everyone was trying to make me feel and do the same thing as everyone else that was pursuing theater things, um, performance aspect. Everybody was like cookie cutter same. And I wish, and I was trying to do that too. And I had wish, I wish that somebody would have told me to hone my special skills more to whatever made me weird or weirder and different from everyone else. I wish someone would have told me to hang on to that and work on that more than anything else, because that is what, how I have, that's how I survive in the world is like my own thing, not being like anyone else, trying not to be like anyone else. Lauren? Uh, don't be so hard on yourself if something isn't completely perfect. Um, and, uh, don't try to, don't, don't try to like be something that you're not. Like, I guess that's another thing that Nick was saying, but to really, um, just embrace, embrace who you are with flaws and all and, uh, and to present yourself as the best version of yourself. All right. And so either of you can jump in here for the final question. If you could only see one show for the rest of your life, but you can see it as many times as you want, what would you see? Hmm. I would say, I got. I think it's Sweeney Todd. I think that's our front runner. Is it really? Yeah, a lot of people say Sweeney Todd. Wow, I have so many favorites. I know, because like I'm also thinking, I love Assassins also, and I love Little Shop of Horrors. Oh, yeah. I would say Rocky Horror. Really? Mm -hmm. I love Rocky Horror, and I I can watch it all day long. (laughs) All right, fair (laughs) enough. So we can find you both online at theskivviesnyc.com, at the skivvy... Oh, if they want to contact you, it's the skivvies bookings. My number is... (laughs) Oh, what? (laughs) (laughs) And you live at... Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Theskivviesbookings at gmail.com. Of course, facebook.com slash theskivviesnyc. Instagram and Twitter at theskivviesnyc. Nick, you are... Clearly, Searly yes. on Instagram. That's right. And Lauren, you're Lomo212. That's right. <laughs> Lomo212. My nickname growing up was always Lomo. And so I just really ran with that with all of my handles. Mm-hmm. I like it. I like it a lot. Okay. You can get more of me at the theaterpodcast.com. Show your support at theaterpodcast.com slash Patreon, P A T R E O N. Find me online on Instagram and Twitter at theater underscore podcast. Please leave a rating, leave a review. This is edited by Matthew Hendershot. Thank you to Jukebox the Ghost for the intro and outro music. And Nick and I Lauren. love them. <laughs> well, you'll hear them in speaking right now. Oh. You, you listen back. You will hear them. Lauren and Nick, thank you so much. This I just been a lot of that. <laughs> Colorful